Hello everybody, welcome back to Unlocked, my new composer series here on YouTube. Episode two belongs to the fantastic composer Colin Riley. Colin and I have been working on his suite of lullabies for solo piano called While Stars Light Your Way Across the Night. So other than that, there is some fantastic chat and laughs with Colin telling us about his life and workings in music and also, of course, his experiences during lockdown. At the end of the video, there is a full performance of the suite, so do stay tuned for some uh, melancholic gorgeousness right at the end. Next week, we are featuring the New Zealand composer, John Pasathis. But until then, I would love you to enjoy the fabulous music and the wonderful chat of Colin Riley. I'm asleep already. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. I love that one. I mean, in a good way, I'm asleep, you know, because it's a lot of Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to be all playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. That's really, really nice. Thank you. So I've got a couple of uh, immediate um, uh, points. Yeah. If you look at phrases, which are the dotted lines one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the eighth and ninth phrases, which yeah. are marked forte mm -hmm. you very nicely played the second of those quietly i know and uh and and it felt like it probably should be quiet um but it that raised the question for me the whole question of dynamics what i liked was that you you lost the um in a good way you lost the the rigid one and a one and a da 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 one and a da da da, da. It, it felt a little bit more fluid in that it was kind of no 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 almost like a a skipping rope that you're just putting a you know when you 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 someone puts an energy into the skipping rope and it creates a little thing here and a little thing there and it felt much more as if you were kind of making it up on the spot <laughs> once you've written a piece of music uh, at the time there's quite some strong uh, system or, or gravity for the piece that's pulling everything into into shape yeah. and uh, you've kind of what's nice is well it's nice for me I think is I forget what all that was at the time so then the piece just becomes like someone else's piece yeah. but when you do this you suddenly do suddenly get back into what it all was yeah. so yeah sorry that that's 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 correct I, I like what you were doing um, I also like the fact that um, this one you could easily go do a lot of rubato on this, but I don't think you should. Mm -hmm. I think what you were doing was kind of hypnotic. It, it was more, I think it's more Tibetan, <laughs> if you like. Um, yeah, yeah. It's almost more gamelan. Um, so I think think gamelan rather than bits and accelerandos. Um, I, I think, think of it much more um, as a kind of a meditation exercise getting involved with the rocking motion all the time. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah. I think you, I think enjoy the moment where it goes inside. Um. Okay. That's one for the video, isn't it? Hello everyone, we are here with the wonderful Mr. Colin Riley. Big hand for Mr. Colin Riley. Hello Colin, how are you doing? I'm doing very well thanks, it's a bit hot but I'm uh, otherwise okay. It's a, tad, it's a tad warm, yes I will give you that. Not, not really conducive to good work but here we are soldiering on. Um, so I wanted to ask you first, um, basically before we hear the pieces I want you to tell us, I'd love to know about this suite, the whole suite and the idea where that came from. Yeah, I mean, it feels a long time ago when I put this together. When exactly was it? Four, four, four years ago, something like that. Yeah. It's probably not that long. Yeah. I mean, I just started getting a little bit of an obsession about writing short pieces because there's phases of my life when you write the epic thing for a one-off performance and you put in, you know, shed loads of work. Uh, and it has like one performance and it's so specific. Whereas in the back of your head, something saying, write a piano piece make it simple 
make it short and you might get like your name on a bill uh, seven times over uh, for very little work compared to the, the larger scale piece. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just got obsessed with writing little pieces. So there's lots of uh, piano collections that I've been writing over the last five or six years, um, which have this idea slightly of um, making some of them harder and some of them very, very simple indeed. So that, you know, younger players and uh, amateur players can tackle some of them. And quite frankly, so I can, I can play them as I'm composing them. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, some of them are on the sim simple side, simply because I enjoy kind of getting involved with what I've been composing and actually trying it out myself. Um, so it's, you know, it's practical as well as kind of aesthetic, I suppose. Brilliant. So you must obviously love writing for piano then. Is it one of your favorite things? Because again, um, like, the, like the video last week, we met through Piano Circus. Yes, we did, we did. Many, many years ago now. I'm not, I, I don't even know how long, um, up at Brunel. Well, I, think I looked that up earlier in preparation. Oh, did you? <laughs> you got my it exactly what it was. I think it's t around about the time you started in the group, possibly, around about 2005? Slightly before my time. I think I, maybe I was 2008. But okay, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just got involved with Piano Circus for a number of reasons, and just knowing some of the members of the group, mm -hmm. and also because they became for uh, a period of time, and still are, uh, a kind of on, uh, ensemble in residence at Brunel University, where, where I teach. So, you know, stars were aligned in that way. But um, I remember being asked if I wanted to write a piece for Piano Circus. And it's one of those things where you think you know what the sound of Piano Circus is. And so once you do, or if you think you do, you then start to think, well, how can I write something they haven't played before? <laughs> or, a, or a kind of music um, that incorporates, what would it be, 12 hands yeah. on, on piano keys. So um, they then gave me the opportunity to write for something which was additional to the set of pianos, like Piano Circus Plus, which I thought was a fascinating idea. And we went through the idea of an electric guitar, a singer, a percussionist, and everything. And we arrived at the fact that I was um, brokering this on ideas with uh, the drummer Bill Bruford, who used to play in Yes, King Crimson, and this, these kind of groups. And um, suddenly the two things kind of became the same thing. And so it became, uh, what was it, four keyboards? No, it was two keyboards, two pianos, slightly cut down version of Piano Circus, plus drum kit. Um, and so that was my first um, uh, kind of way of working with Piano Circus. And it was kind of indicative, I think, of my approach to sort of like saying, can I go in the side entrance rather than the front entrance? Because it kind of might be more exciting. So the idea of adding something to the group was straight away a little bit anarchic, I suppose. And then also saying, well, I don't want all six people. We just want, you know, four. Mm -hmm. It's that old idea of like drum kit and piano kind of, Hammers and keys, they just go so well together, don't they? Yeah, I mean, Hammers and Keys was, was the starting point, in fact, and, and the title of the album, which we recorded, then became Skin and Wire, mm. in the same way it was talking about the skin of the drums and the wire of the strings and piano. So it was a kind of exactly a, a kind of derivation of what, of what you've just said. But the piano is a percussive instrument if you look at it one way, mm. and uh, it's many other things like an accompaniment instrument. Um, but I was just using it as a kind of um, enlargement of the rhythm section so that the, the, uh, we performed it live once and um, it was mainly a recorded kind of concept. Yeah. Um, but we had the drums in the middle and fanning out, we had the keyboards and the pianos. And so the idea was at times uh, what was the splinters off the drum kit became sort of things that the pianist uh, took hold of and, and extemporized around. So it was kind of, again, subverting the idea that the drums might play along and just provide a sort of back backbeat to the more complicated front, front foreground music of the pianos. Mm -hmm. You use so many different things in your compositional process. So I remember when we did um, Pearl, Bob and Wayne, for example, we had uh, three people on pianos and three people inside playing percussion and the inside. Yes, percussion. yes. When we did Squiggles, Squiggle and Ebcast, we had yeah. video and electronics. And you use yeah. video and electronics quite a lot, don't you? Well, it's all there to use. So it sometimes just uh, gets thrown at me as a possibility. And sometimes I think, wouldn't it be nice if you could put that with that? Um, the idea of using the what was kind of partially live VJing um, at the time was, was the idea that if you were performing inside the piano, most of the time you just see someone's 
back, let's say. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you, they're stooped over and it's like very undynamic. You're like, what are they doing in there? Are, you know, are they knitting or they lost something? So it seemed like the way that if you could put um, live VJ cameras above, you could see the wonderful strings of the, of the piano and the hammers. And you could also see the hands at play inside. So it became a kind of choreography, I suppose, for, for the group. Yeah. And I'd seen that in play when, when you, you do this thing where you all move seats and, and you, you look away and someone's moved to somewhere else. It was kind of indulging in that same uh, choreography. So that rather than just move seats, sometimes people moved to play inside the piano. And I think one of the movements ended with everybody clustered around one piano playing inside the piano. I think the idea that composers today kind of have so many things at their fingertips and I've seen this happen during my kind of working life. I mean, I remember when I started off, uh, well, I mean, and before then even, but you know, it was all pencils and rubbers. And if you're a bit fancy, you were doing something with a special pen and some special sort of tracing paper. And then everyone had to buy an Acorn computer that would run the first Sibelius software, uh, etc. So, and so it goes on. Now, of course, we've got so many things that, that in theory make things quicker. Um, the, the, the danger, of course, with the technology is that you just end up doing what the bit of technology does well. So, for instance, if you're using samples to replace real instruments, all you end up doing is not writing the music that you want, but writing the music that sounds good on those samples, which, for instance, in strings can do certain things well, yeah. but other things are really crap. You know, so um, it, it's just important to know whether the technology is leading you or you're kind of in charge of the technology. But technology is one thing. Um, we've obviously got any instruments that we play as musicians. Um, I play the cello and a few other instruments, uh, but I spend a lot of time composing at the piano. And I do spend a lot of time with um, these big pads of manuscript paper and a 4B has to be 4B pencil and a special pencil sharpener and a special kind of rubber. Um, not, that, not that it's about being controlled, it's just about, I want, if, I want things to work. Yeah. So sometimes uh, you can spend hours and hours and hours thinking about something and getting nowhere. And sometimes there's just a little burst of energy mm -hmm. and you need to be able to sort of get it somewhere onto the page, into you know, your phone by just recording it yeah. or into the fingers or, or whatever it might be. Sometimes I film things. So it's just a tool, whatever it is that you need to get something that's inside kick-started somewhere else. Yeah. And so what is next for you then? What can we listen to? And I know you've got, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, I, um, I still hope this is coming up, your violin concerto, your new violin yeah. concerto. Yeah. Well, of course, like every, well, most other composers at the moment, um, everyone's just had everything cancelled. And that sometimes means postponed uh, and you keep your fingers crossed. And sometimes it means it's kicked into the long grass, which means it sort of gets forgotten about and, and actually it's, it's over with and the moment has passed. I'm hoping it's not the latter of those. Yeah. Um, but what has happened is I've suddenly got to this point where I've suddenly got people interested in me writing music for, for, the, for their orchestra. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's a difficult enough job and it could take many years to get people kind of interested and convinced uh, that you're, you're right for the job. And so, yes, I was having a violin concerto premiered um, for Philippa Moe in September. Yeah. And also in September I was having a, I, know, I can call it a symphony probably, but I, I don't call it that, but a five movement orchestral work, mm -hmm. about sort of 40 minutes long, by uh, the Helsingborg Symphony Orchestra in Sweden both of which have been obviously cancelled. So um, it's strange because what you do as a composer is the, 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 the time you're most active is the time when people don't see you most active. 
you know what I mean? So if you're out there having a concert or a premiere where you're talking about your music, um, you've done all the work, it's another time. <laughs> That's not the work. So, you know, those long hours um, composing it, and before that, the many, many emails and the meetings and the conversations and the sending stuff off, is it's a long, long process. Um, I remember um, I wrote before that a, a double cello concerto for... Uh, Gabby Swallow and Guy Johnston and ah, both of them. Two of my yeah, very mutual, friends, my guys. <laughs> mutual friends, yeah, yeah. And I think it took me six years to sort of get that to fruition. Yeah. Uh, including the composition and the rehearsal and before that the funding and the interest and getting the stars aligned. Mm -hmm. And it was performed once. So it gives you it gives you a kind of indicator sometimes of the highs and lows that composers can can go through. I mean, I hope it will be performed again. Um, uh, but that's a sort of, I imagine now all composers at the moment are sharing in that kind of um, loss and that frustration, uh, because it does take a lot to work up the confidence to sort of put yourself out there and say, this is what my, this is what my music is, and yeah, put your trust in me, and I'll, I'll write you something. So that's the, the long answer to what I'm, sort of not doing <laughs> because of what's uh, been cancelled. Yeah. But um, there are lots of other plans afoot because, and you probably know this about me anyway, uh, once once one thing gets kicked out of the frame, I just have to go and get another thing to sort of work with. Yeah, of course. So, You've um, been super productive and proactive. Well, have. yeah, yeah. I just don't think it's about waiting or, or even expecting anybody to think you're a composer or anybody to uh, just invite you to do something uh, i think you've got to kind of go out with ideas i think i think ideas are what matter um and if obviously if you can craft a good answer to to make that idea work then then that's even better but i th i found in my working life it's all been about making something happen uh and when you get sort of knocked back with one thing it just builds you up stronger to sort of say well, okay we, that idea will park that for now or I'll change it later but I've got this other idea <laughs> um, and I've never really been able to work any other way I suppose. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's well, a lovely way of working. I mean, I mean I'm sure musicians do it too as well you know you might have some, yeah. you know a piece and then and then put it to one side and then come back to it a few years later with a completely different outlook. I mean even when we worked on um, Stars together you were going through it going well, I think I might change that. Or what do you think? Maybe yeah, yeah. Well, it never, it's never really quite finished in my book. Um, yeah. That's not because I'm a control freak, I don't think, or because I'm a perfectionist. It's just that you see something differently on a different day. Mm. And, um, you know, you just want to make it right for the moment, I suppose. Cool. Yeah. Well, really love to know about your approach to the piano then, Colin, because these pieces, as you say, are quite simple, um, you know, harmonically, um, really beautiful, atmospheric. Um, you've got other pieces that are much more difficult, you said. Yeah, I've written a lot for the piano, probably. It, mainly because, you know, I work at the piano as part of the process. Um, but um, it, it also means you can hear certain things back and, and kind of work out whether something is kind of nice to play. You know, you can make music and... and, and if you're composing in any sort of conventional sense that you're notating for somebody else to play, I think there's uh, an onus on you to sort of think about how it's played. I mean, sometimes you don't want to give like string players all the up bows and down bows, mm -hmm. um, but you know, an, an over notate. But I think it's important that you, um, as a composer, kind of feel it. So that's part of the answer. I, I've also been interested in being, a, being what people term composer performer. I don't think I, I'm not sure I like that term, but the idea that sometimes you venture into into being the person who might play. So I formed a a, a band about um, 10, 12 years ago, which is called Move, and we intermittently play. But I decided the best person to play the piano was me. Um, so it led to me thinking about what that actually meant, and I was keen to explore some more improvising in what I did, and also bring in some more technology. So. I found a sort of way of, of making my piano music that I would play, which was kind of easy, but maybe sounds a little bit interesting because it was had this amalgam of where it was composed, uh, where it was improvised and where the, the sort of um, technology was kind of woven through it. So I, I, that's one of the things if people were 
kind of interested in finding out more about another I side to my music. It, yeah, I didn't, know, um, I didn't know that. So give us, um, give us a little listening list. Yeah, well, but there's two Move albums that are out there on, on Spotify and all the usual stuff. Uh, the first one was enigmatically called Fold, and oh. equally en uh, trying to be enigmatic at least. Anyway, the second one was called Here. Um, I love this one word thing. So many people. Yeah, yeah. So the, the third one is in. Yeah, the third one is in in um, the process of being kind of uh, gradually uh, fermented. But it was just the idea of putting my money where my mouth is, really, and being really interested in making songs. Um, uh, I mean, from the times when I was in a band and a, and a songwriter, mm -hmm. uh, through to the idea that you know you could put a really interesting uh, collection of people and and forces together. So the band has a singer. Uh, it has me on the piano and electronics. It has an electric bass, guitar, uh, percussion and cello. And a lot of those instruments are all treated. Uh, so there's this, this melting pot of you're not quite sure where one instrument might leave another instrument. talents so, you know one one minute it's huge orchestral symphonies and the next minute it's kind of like yes. i am i am told by some people i've spread myself a bit thin but uh i think it's just a question of um you say to those people <laughs> well I, don't, I, don't, I just there's too many things to get involved with and if you are if you listen widely some people say they listen to all these things and then you listen to their music and it sounds like they listen to just one thing yeah. <laughs> and i don't understand how it hasn't filtered into their their music a little bit more that's not to say what i how it's not to say my music is a sort of hodgepodge because I, I, I think it's everything but that but i think it's this kind of filtering in and letting it brew for quite some time and then then letting it out in certain key ways like turning the tap on for this way of working so i mean i yes the, that's the long answer but the the slightly shorter answer is i have lots of um, pieces for piano, some use weird and wonderful ideas about making drum kits resonate in tune with them where they're more like uh, sort of sonic installations. There's a piece called Hanging in the Balance which you, you could check out. Um, through to very quiet um, kind of pieces like um, the, the lullabies that you, you've been playing. Um, so it, it's, it's all there, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, apart from the fact that you're obviously a super busy guy, because you're also a professor of composition at Brunel University, aren't you? Um, I don't want to bring the mood down by asking, like, oh. how how did all that go through COVID, and how is um, it's just how have you kind of been through that? And um, yeah, the COVID question is really important because I don't think it's about looking at it here and now and how we've all been stopped from doing x and y z for three and four months it's more about how the next four or five years will fan out not to do with what we can and can't do because that's the wrong question it's like will it solicit any kind of big change and is there a change needed anyway um in the way that we present music who it's for um i mean as a as a performer you're doing that you know in essence by doing these videos and some of the work I know that you do through Piano Circus and other things. Lots of performers have started to think about that and obviously composers too. And it's, it's a serious point because it's not just about let's sort of replicate a concert and live stream it. That's good, that's nice, but yeah. it's not the same as a live concert. It's yeah. a stream concert. So I don't know where it's gonna lead, but I think it's, it's going to lead hopefully to something quite radical and possibly it could be leading to something very, very good. I mean, don't want to get bang on about anything in particular, but it seems like um, the state of uh, mainstream education in terms of music is in a, a dreadful state. And when you then learn that, you know, things like poetry are no longer going to be um, 
compulsory in the English curriculum, uh, you, you wonder what's next for music. Um, yeah, and it feels like it's just spinning out of control a little at the moment, yeah. don't they? and you just have to kind of, you just have to grab on and hold on and hope that we land somewhere where we yes. are not obsolete anymore. Yeah, I just hope that all these things will make people look radically about um, how music is good for us. Um, you know, I, I bang on about the, 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 the learning an instrument is probably more important than learning maths at school. Yeah, so why, why doesn't everybody have that? Because then later life, when, when they want something to do, uh, they'll find it much more interesting to play the piano or the trumpet than do a maths equation. I don't understand why anyone would want... I mean, it's useful in society, but I think in terms of our well-being and the way we connect, which has all started to sound a little bit hippie, but... I think music will find its, its hopefully find its resonance for people um, because there's a lot, we can treat it a lot better mm -hmm. in our, our society. I think we can have it uh, much deep, more, more deeply embedded in schools uh, and I think new music has got a long way to go in terms of how it can reach people like new cinema reaches people and like new um, uh, exhibitions. Uh, photography exhibitions, whatever they might be, um, new comedy series, new any other art form is seen as a positive thing. Yeah. New music, people start to get a bit suspicious. What's going on? Well, I like it, you know. So it's there's something not happening. This music has not quite made it yet. So maybe, maybe the effect of COVID might shake it up in a good way. Who knows? Oh, we hope so. We hope so. All the music that I've written. Uh, is published by this really great um, small publisher, but very innovative, called Composers Edition. And they've got lots of really great composers there. And it's a nice new um, fangled way of being a publisher, um, uh, from the, very different to the old school of stuff. Um, and so you can go on, on there and there's lots of, lots of piano pieces on there, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, so you heard that. You can go and get some of Colin's music. And we need more than one performance of these things. Absolutely. Just yeah. go out and get it. And they're, they're roughly kind of, you know, um, grade eight-ish, would you say? I mean, you need, you need musicality. Yes, yes, you do. I think possibly the second one, the dum da da dum da 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 yeah. That's possibly grade six or seven, is it? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. That's it's, um, as long as you as long as you've got the musicality to cover yes. it to get yeah. um but definitely people go out and buy some of Colin's music definitely on composer's edition I will leave a link below actually oh, that's all and, good. Yeah. Um, I'll put it I'll put it in the titles at the end as well so uh we have come to the end and we will play the video now so a huge thank you to the wonderful Mr Colin Riley thanks Colin it's thank you for listening everybody and I hope you enjoy the music thanks Dawn pleasure <laughs>